A title slide identifies the session as what is still needed for fathers to thrive in child welfare. Come on in the room, y'all. Come on in the room. The video of the speakers begins and continues throughout the session. The first speaker is identified on screen as Brandy Hudson, Capacity Building Center for States. She slash her. We are excited and we are happy to have this conversation today. We have two wonderful lived experience experts who are going to be sharing from their personal and professional expertise around fatherhood and what it takes for fathers to thrive in child welfare. We're going to have a conversation about what we know works, what some of those gaps are, and these tremendous experts are going to share their lessons learned and some ideas that they hope all of you will take back to your work to strengthen your support of fathers. I see we are exactly at time and I don't want to waste one minute because I'm telling you these two folks that we have with us today have a ton of information and expertise that they want to impart to you. So I am Brandy Hudson. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So wonderful to see everyone today. I'm going to be moderating today's conversation with our two expert discussants. We have Joey Cordero and Jason Bragg with us here today, both of whom have both personal and professional experience in child welfare, really working to strengthen and support fathers in the process of reunification. I am going to turn it over to Joey and Jason to briefly introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about both their personal and professional experience working with fathers, and share a little bit about why they're so excited um, to support dads in the work that they do every single day. And I will start with you, Jason. Thank you, Brandy. The speaker is identified on screen as Jason Bragg, Family Resilience Community Consulting. He slashed him. Uh, my name is Jason Bragg, and I am a contracted social service worker with the Washington State Office of Public Defense. Uh, I work in a multidisciplinary team uh, supporting fathers. Uh, I'm a part of uh, several uh, initiative items here in Washington State, helping to change policy and practice uh, to better support parents uh, towards their goal of reunification. Thank you so much, Jason and Joey. I'm going to kick it over to you. Good morning, everybody. The speaker is identified on screen as Joey Cordero, Capacity Building Center for States. He slash him. My name is Joey Cordero. I'm out of San Francisco, California. Yeah, I just um, also part of a multidisciplinary team here in San Francisco, working directly with attorneys. Um, I'm also a family consultant for the Center of States. And um, uh, prior to that, I um, was chaired the San Francisco for, uh, Fatherhood Initiative for, for about a decade. And uh, that's still still going on. And, um, and just did uh, been doing a lot of work around uh, fatherhood here in San Francisco and now with you all as well. Happy to be here. Awesome, Joy. We're so happy to have you here. And I want to share that Jason also is going to be joining the center as a new family consultant. So very, very excited to have both of you, not just here for this conversation, but to have your expertise really inform the work that the center is doing and continued support of the field. I am going to ask our lovely uh, tech team to launch today's polling question. So we wanted to kick off today with a quick poll for you all, um, just to kind of ask from your perspective where you sit um, in child welfare, what do fathers need to thrive? And throughout today's conversation with our discussants, I encourage folks to put your questions in the chat. When we talk about strategies, we talk about approaches. If you have things that you're doing in your jurisdiction or your community or your agency that you want folks to know, drop it in the chat. We want all of the ideas. We want all of the success stories so that we can continue to further our work in supporting fathers throughout the child welfare system. So please, please, please engage with us in the chat during today's conversation. Oh, and we have 82% participation in this poll, you guys. That is amazing. As someone who does polls often on Zoom, I don't know that I've ever got to 82%, particularly not with like 300 people. So I am excited. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And Anthony, are we sharing the results now? Yep, the results shared. I just awesome. Thought so as you can see, <laughs> the majority of people recognize that all of the above are needed, right? It takes, you know, a lot of support and resources and intentionality to really support fathers and to make sure that they are successful and that their children can thrive. And I really think this is important because we all play a role. So no matter who you are, where you come from, where you sit, there's something that you can do to strengthen our support of fathers. So thank you so much for that. And we are going to move into today's dialogue with our experts. And the first question that I have for Joey and Jason today is from your experience, both you know personal and professional, what efforts have you seen that lead to successful research? unification for fathers? What are some of the strategies that you've seen in your work be most effective? And Joey, we can start with you. Sure. Yeah. I, well, the first thing that comes to mind uh, when you ask that, Brandy, is, is here in San Francisco, uh, of course, this was 10 years yeah. ago when we first started our first fatherhood group, that um, that was one piece that I saw that was very effective in, in our jurisdiction. Um, one, it was a place that uh, child welfare workers had to refer, were able to refer fathers to um, uh, get services. And then, of course, being the facilitator of that group, I saw the strength of, of them actually engaging with myself, a, a father that had been through the system, and helping them be vulnerable maybe for the first time, because they're not able to talk through some of these things that they're going through. And so that that group allowed for a lot of things to happen. One, a safe place for fathers to talk about the issues that they're going through, and maybe even talk about the issues that that they were a part of and um, for the first time and, and helping them understand that they can change. And then also, um, yeah, from there, just being able to team with um, other folks that were referring, like particularly the child welfare worker and helping uh, dads navigate through the system and kind of understand like all the language that's coming at them um, and breaking some of those things down and helping them understand, you know, from what the legal timeline is about. But um, that was to be the first thing that was most effective in the beginning. And then some other things happened off of that, but I'll let Jason tell you about some more of those. Thanks, Joey. Yeah, one of the things that I've noticed that is extremely effective is getting as much support around uh, fathers as possible. The system is predominantly geared towards uh, supports uh, in the community, especially around mothers, right? And there's not a lot of supports geared for fathers. And what has been successful working in a multidisciplinary team is having somebody that can help communicate with the attorney and with providers to really lift up and give dad a voice at the table uh, and help him develop his voice in a way that's not, uh, you know, received as threatening or aggressive. Uh, we hear a lot of those terms thrown out in relationships to dads. Um, and those are, you know, word, words are really powerful when we're, uh, you know, paint brushing individuals in, a, in an entire demographic. Um, and it's tran transforming that to uh, really bring fathers to the table and help them understand and see their importance. And when you have uh, folks in a multidisciplinary team doing that, you're really bringing not just the father, but the father's family, their culture, their identity, um, that are all tied and uh, part of that child that's involved in the system. Thanks, Jason. And for those who may not be using MDTs, can you talk a little bit about who some of the folks are that are part of that team and where they come from? Yeah, so, you know, here in Washington State, we have uh, a variety of different uh, folks that are involved in the uh, multidisciplinary teams. Uh, we have, I believe, there's 30 different uh, parents with lived experience across the state out of uh, 60 
uh, defense social workers or defense social service workers, um, and really understanding uh, how the system works and being able to walk side by side and connect uh, fathers to uh, targeted supports that are going to help build on their strengths and identify the pieces where they are strong already um, as a parent and be able to um, build from there, right? Instead of focusing on what dad doesn't have and, and how dad's falling short, focusing on the strengths of where they're at, meeting them where they're at, and then building from there. Thanks so much, Jason. That's really important to recognize strengths and come from a strength-based perspective. And I don't know that we always think through that lens with fathers. And one of the things that you mentioned that I think is really important to lift up is what I call the fear factor um, in working with fathers. And that sometimes, you know, the reason or what contributes to the lack of engagement with fathers is really the system's fear of engaging with dads. And so what have you seen actually be effective in reducing and mitigating that fear factor? Yeah, so one of the things that I do when working with the fathers that I work with is I help give them little pieces of information to help uh, mitigate some of that fear. Um, and one of the things is helping fathers understand that our voices carry, we're a little bit louder. And so when we're in meetings, you know, uh, sometimes our passion and our love for our children gets mistaken for anger. Um, and aggression. And so I help them by just starting out the meeting saying, you know, giving a little disclaimer, saying, hey, please don't mistake my, my passion and love for my child uh, as anger. I might be frustrated, but that's okay. I'm just caught up in a system that I don't really understand. And I'm really trying to just get back to my child. I'm trying to have my child return to me. So, you know, please don't mistake that. I also give them a strategy of, you know, leaning a little bit back in your chair so that your voice doesn't project as much. Um, I've seen many times, especially working with dads of color, um, being characterized as angry and aggressive um, and, and really, you know, helping dads realize how they're received and knowing that we can't necessarily change that in the middle of, a, of their case, right? Like we can't combat that. So how do we navigate through that, realizing that it's there and then keeping our eye on the goal, which is bringing our child home. Thanks so much for that, Jason. And Joey, I just wanted to, before we pivot to our next question, create space to see if there was anything that you wanted to add. Yeah, I, I, you know, everything that Jason is saying is, is so true. And um, um, I, I talk about it like the bass in our voice. Um, and sometimes, yeah, in a hallway of a courtroom, right, that, that can really carry. But also, I would add that um, just teaching dads how to be assertive, because, because bear, stuffing things down and, and, and um, can lead to a lot of anger and frustration, but being able to teach them how to engage the system. And that was something that I had to learn. So this is what I'm giving dads to, like, hey, we got we to gotta get that out there. And so helping them engage the system that's so hard in that's having a hard time engaging them. So just just, just modeling for them that look, we got to get that out there. So sometimes I'm you know, from a from a peer to peer base or a father to father base, I'm able to hear things. Now it's about teaching them. And maybe they may not have the skill set right at front. So I'll teach them how to fire off that email or make that phone call. This is what it sounds like. And you know, you could still have the base in your voice. You can still be you. I know you're walking on eggshells, but it's important for your voice to get out there and, and let the worker know what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Man, I'm really, glad. <laughs> Sorry, Joey, I'm, really, I'm really glad you brought up email. Uh, that's another strategy that I use to help fathers kind of get their needs met. Um, is uh, the two email system is what I kind of use. Um, and for fathers, I ask them to send an email and copy their social worker or uh, copy their attorney on an email to their caseworker or social worker and, you know, talk about it, it very brief, right? 
but it's, it's creating that dialogue of, I went to my SUD treatment this week. This is what I learned. I attended two sober supports. I, you know, blah, blah, blah. Just what services you're engaged in and like one thing that you took from that service that you did, right? And then ending that email with a, and this is what I need. I need more bus passes. I need a gas card. I need housing referrals. I need, right? Like, and just leaving it at that. And then the second email that I ask them to send is uh, to their attorney and their attorney only. And when they send that email to their attorney, that's when they give the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like, don't send a book, but a couple paragraphs of what's going on, what your visits look like, what any barriers, things that are happening uh, in your life, challenges that you're experiencing. Um, that way your attorney isn't having to play catch up. You know, if you're only going to court every 90 days or every six months, your attorney doesn't have to try to squeeze six months of life into 10 minutes, right? Also, it creates a good record when you're for your attorney. You know, if the, if the caseworker happens to maybe file a report saying they haven't been able to get a hold of you and there hasn't really been any communication, your attorney can then just print all the emails that you've been sending weekly, right? Um, it really helps both from the legal strategy and for the fathers getting their needs met um, and opening that dialogue so that uh, caseworkers or social workers can have that relationship. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for that, Jason. I just wanted to acknowledge that we had a question in the chat that I think is a really important question around mm -hmm. what are some engagement strategies or things um, that you've seen be successful as far as approaches to working with incarcerated fathers or fathers who um, you know, may have been uh, perpetrators of domestic violence and have restraining orders or some, you know, further barriers. What, what have you seen be effective working with those fathers in particular? Yeah, I, um, well, for me, um, you know, as a direct service provider and, and, and thinking about those things, it's, it's really about well, uh, thinking about DV perpetrators. You know, there's so many different levels of that. But I think when if, if a father is willing to come in and identify the behavior and willing to change that behavior, I can work with them. And it's just about really getting to understand them, because I know a lot of times um, the system will cookie cut and say, OK, we got to get them to 52 weeks. Um, but sometimes when I'm engaging with folks that are that are uh, fathers that are perpetrators, it's really about just getting the real narrative and what's really happening. Because when we think about incarcerated fathers or fathers that are DV perpetrators, they're not just that. They didn't start that way. So can we get in there? Is this is this um, is this a behavior that can change? Um, and so if he's able to take ownership. We can we can start working on some things and then get some accurate information and moving away from just a single story and actually getting in there and finding out who he is and um, and and working on some things. But the incarcerated father too. I don't know, Jason, if you want to jump on that. Yeah, you know, oh, it's this is going to sound terrible, but one of the things that I like most about working with incarcerated fathers is you have a captive audience. Right. Like you, you, you're you're literally you're talking to somebody who is incarcerated. You might be one of the only connections to the outside world. Right. And you can really partner with the with the state uh, caseworker and help get some supports, you know, uh, depending on your state. Right. Uh, getting visitation going uh, in into uh, into this the facility. Uh, you can also. Um, I help fathers uh, start a journal for their for their child, right? And talk about, you know, just a daily log of like what they're thinking about, about their child, you know, basically like little mini letters, right? Because that's something really powerful to be able to give to your child, to let your child know and build that relationship when, you, when you're separated physically, right? Um, as far as the working with dads that have, you know, DV history. Um, I think that as a system, we have to be willing to look out beyond the standard DV service 
uh, array, right? Um, look at applying different behavioral modification uh, services, looking at cognitive behavioral therapy, um, DBT, uh, MRT, DVMRT, right? Some of these behavior changing uh, services I've seen be really successful. And I've also seen dads be pretty resistant that have a history that have maybe gone to these, uh, the DVBT groups prior um, that didn't really find those very helpful, but found it more helpful to be meeting one on one and learning some skills around uh, around what that looks like to have that behavior change, right? And connecting it back to uh, for dads to connect it back to their experience with their kids and what that looks like um, of how the kids could be affected. Because I find some dads are like, man, I don't care what how that was received, right? But when you start talking about the messaging that the, the child is going to get when we're looking at a shared parenting or cooperative parenting after the case is dismissed, right? They're having that visit. That's a real powerful message to be able to connect them to, to get them in the place where they start eliciting that change talk. Yeah. And uh, you know what, the, just real quick, uh, in looking at those, because we looked in at perpetrators, and when we think about dads that are victims of domestic violence as well. Um, uh, what I found out in my work is that you find out that perp the perpetrators are often victims as well. It's just that he got the charge or he got the stay away order and that's how it's written down. So that's why it's important to move away from the single story because when you get dads in a safe place to talk about things, you really find out, wow, there was, there was uh, you were actually a victim before and it went both ways, you know, and you just didn't get out of there or you didn't, you didn't take that. Um, so creating those, those uh, strategies for them to understand what actually happened to them. That's the only way you can get to the root of the behavior change. And that's why I like what Jason is saying. When we think about, it's not just a 52 week, we might be able to come up with a different strategy if we find out what is really happening there. Mm -hmm. um so yeah to think about those things together and be creative with the services yeah thank you both so much and i know i feel like we could have had a whole conversation just about working with incarcerated fathers we could have a whole conversation just about working with you know intimate partner violence impacted families oh my gosh this is so good you guys and we have a ton going on in the chat so thank you all for chiming in and i just encourage participants if you have strategies and approaches that you've seen be helpful in your own jurisdictions please put it in the chat and share with your colleagues one of the things that i wanted to elevate because i know joey and jason this came up you know in a prior conversation is the impact of trauma and recognizing that many of the fathers that we are working to support in child welfare have experienced you know a number of aces and are you know trauma survivors themselves. And so when we think about trauma informed and trauma sensitive approaches, like how do we apply that to fathers? And so I just wanted to kind of create a little bit of space to have you both talk about that a little bit because when you brought it up, I just thought it was very profound and something that I don't think we think enough about. Yeah, I it, it's it's big and you know, I didn't really discover it until I till I worked on my own and went backward down the path. And um, and I had this aha moment of healing through my own trauma. And so that's what I try to bring forward um, with with some of the fathers that I'm work that I work with directly in, in, in groups and just being really mindful that folks in in the community been through things and it, and this may not be the only system that that's that they've been involved with. There may be other systems that they came through. And when you start getting to know people, you understand they went through these things and they may have not got the services that they needed to heal from that. So some of those, some of the groups that I've been in, this might be the first time someone's been able to do a little bit of work, you know? And so being really mindful of that, of how to open them up and close them up. And, um, you know, that's just been really, um, fascinating to me to actually see people do some of that work in the beginning and then also just to know that what I'm actually doing for them and um and then also kind of closing it up as well and and some guys you know end up moving to, towards therapy as well after doing some group work but um 
Yeah, it's it's fascinating to see folks be vulnerable for the first time and share issues that they've been going through. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, yeah, that's gold. I, I think that when you when you're working with dads that have that that are coming from that trauma, I didn't even know that what my life looked like before was trauma. Right. I didn't know those things were traumatic. Those that was just life. Right. right. Like. People were like, oh, well, that was dysfunctional. I'm like, man, dysfunctional was the toaster I had at home when I was growing up as a kid, right? Not, <laughs> not my life. This is what everyday life looked like. And so helping dads kind of connect that back to see how, like, this is where this is coming from, man. Like, you're, it, it comes from a history of you not feeling safe, not getting your needs met, and not being okay, right? And and once they start to kind of have that ball of yarn unravel, it's like when you pull that string, right? And it starts unraveling, um, connecting with them in a compassionate and empathetic way uh, really helps them want to move forward. And they're like, oh man, I really want to get, I want to get through this. I don't want to experience this again, right? And uh, I found it to be really beneficial um in working with dads that are coming from that to realize their own trauma um and to be able to grow from that thank you both so much and i know we had a question in the chat around any specific strategies um to engage and support men of color specifically um in child welfare so do you all have strategies or techniques or advice for systems who are looking to really create more equity in their system as it relates to fathers of color Man, uh, I was just talking about this last week um, in another group, which is, uh, man, we, we need to have folks that are trying to engage folks that reflect the people we're trying to engage, right? Uh, we need to have professionals, providers. Um, when you have a, a whole table, uh, you know, it, as a, what I've heard shared with me several times, and I know me as a white man, coming into a system and sitting at a table full of women, man, that's a little scary for me, right? On how I'm going to be received. And then hearing from dads that I work with, you know, particularly black fathers in particular are like, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm just going to sit back and, and kind of ride this out. Right. And what that kind of translates to and how the system receives that is a father that's not really wanting to be engaged or have anything to do with the case. Right. Um, but the key piece that's being missed is that he's showing up, right? Just not understanding how to engage or how to use his voice. He doesn't want to scare anyone. He doesn't want to be portrayed as angry, right? And so his, so his inaction also works against him, right? Um, I know that for one of the best strategies that I've had in my decade of practicing uh, is lunch, um, that is like the best strategy that I've had. Um, and I don't talk about the case. I don't talk about, uh, I don't talk about the services that need to get done. I don't talk about where the case is at as far as terminations pending, any of that, right? I, I take the dad out to lunch. It costs like maybe $10. And I just say, Hey man, tell me about your kids. Tell me, what do you love about being a father? Right. And when, when you start connecting those pieces of like, what do you love about being a father? What do you love about uh, your kids? You know, what makes you smile, right? Like what caused you to come, no one ordered you to come have lunch with me, right? What, what, what was the driving force, right? It was your kids, right? And so once you get, you make that connection, you can start building from there and, and the dad will steer the conversation to, what do I need to do to get my kid back in my life, right? Because it's, it, it's a encompassing conversation when you start talking about the love and passion that a dad has for his child and you bring that to the forefront versus here's a list of things I need you to do. Mm -hmm. So that's been my best strategy. Thanks so much, Jason. Joey, any thoughts? Yeah, I think that, uh, well, everything that Jason said, but the, 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 whole, the whole piece about it is just really being understanding of what fathers of color are, are experiencing in the community. And if you can be mindful of that, that they're approaching this 
they may be thinking about you like you're going to slam the door anyway, but let me just let me just kind of walk through this. And so what they you got to kind of get get in there and build that relationship. So those strategies in there that that Jason is giving about that, but just understanding that, you know, fathers of color are coming in. There may be shame that they that they're holding. They might, might be wearing that, but they're not going to show you that. There may be pride that's being that so that they don't want to really necessarily tell you that they don't know. Mm -hmm. But if, if they're in front of you and they're, and they're coming through the door, know that in their heart, they're trying to engage. So get in there, build that relationship. And you don't necessarily need to get into the child welfare case be, uh, all directly, because I feel like a lot of those, uh, the, questions that you need to do uh, that you're trying to get answered because um, in that report you can and you can get those questions answered by let's just you that mm -hmm. that gate will just overflow once you build that relationship and they know that you're authentically trying to engage with them and find out about them mm -hmm. um, so I'll just echo what Jason said Thank you so much, Joey and Jason. And I cannot believe that we are at time for this session. They say time flies when you're having fun. Time also flies. Don't let this conversation stop here. Talk to the experts in your own community and continue to seek the knowledge that you need to meet the needs of fathers so that they can in turn meet the needs of their children. Thank you again for joining this session and thank you to Joey and Jason. The Child Welfare Virtual Expo, CWVE displays and is followed by this statement. This video was developed for the Child Welfare Virtual Expo by the Capacity Building Center for States and is sponsored by the Children's Bureau. Its content does not necessarily reflect the view and policies of the Children's Bureau. Mm -hmm.